Hi, I'm Michelle Fenton, and welcome to the Happy Texture Podcast. What would it take to develop resilient, sustainable communities? How do we design cities that support our collective happiness? Join me as my guests and I discuss how we can plan, implement, and foster places that allow us to flourish and grow. Thank you for joining me on this Happy Texture podcast. On today's episode, I had the great pleasure of sitting down with Samantha Sanella from Cushman Wakefield. We talked about living in the country, rabbits, and the huge, amazing potential to rethink workplace as a place for happiness and well-being. Here's part of that conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. There's there's something going on. There's a a zeitgeist in the way we design offices as a potential. And what I really wanted to focus on was how if people are in their offices for majority yes. of their lives. Yes. And the pursuit of happiness is something that we all want to achieve. It's not just mm-hmm. some people. And I've never heard a person say, actually, I'm not interested in being happy. Mm. And so, I th- and then we started talking and he says, yeah, like happy texture. And I said, huh. Mm. So that's how it came about. Yeah. And it kind of stuck and it has a nice ring to it. Well, the idea of the pursuit of happiness is sort of been my philosophy for 10 years. Actually, 10 years ago tomorrow, my sister passed away. Oh. And I had, at that time, I had already lost my brother and my sister. I'm sorry, my brother and my father and my mother. But when my sister passed away, I sort of became obviously really depressed. Mm -hmm. And in order to snap out of it, I got a dog. Because my sister loved dogs. I never wanted a dog because I have two kids and I have a lot of responsibility or whatever. But then I was like, you know what? My sister had nine dogs when she died. She loved dogs. And I was like, you know what? She knew something I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Let me get a dog. So I got this dog. And then even just one month of having that dog, I was like, you know what life's about? It's about the pursuit of happiness. And I know that seems so like, oh, really? You, You took you that long to learn that? But what the dog showed me, their sole goal in life is just to be happy. Yes. You know, and they're such happy creatures. Yes. It takes very little for them to be happy. And then I thought to myself, okay, Sam, focus on the little things and you'll be happy. Yes. So that's what I've done since. Good happy. for you. Yeah. But it took a long time to learn that lesson. It takes a long, I, I mean, it's, a, it's an evolving process to be happy and it does take attention and awareness. Yes. It doesn't just happen. You have to really decide that that's what you want to do and edit all the other stuff out yes it's just yeah. like the lesson learned from the dog yes. i don't know i mean you know uh and then eventually i got another dog so now i have two dogs no. well, <laughs> more to come <laughs> no it's enough we have uh two dogs two sons and a snake so that's enough oh geez. I've got a full house <laughs> I have a full house yeah but um the past couple of years with the pandemic i started focusing on painting and writing more. So I've always painted and write a bit, wrote, wrote, but behind the scenes, write it, silly me, wrote, but behind the scenes sort of, but I never put it out to the public. And then one of my friends who's a piano player and a singer, he started doing a online show. It's great because then we had this sort of virtual piano bar during the pandemic and we'd all log on and we'd watch him play and sing once or twice a week. Uh, for the first part of the pandemic, he did it every day for 50 days. And I was like, you know what? It takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And architects are all artists at heart, right? And then we just, you know, a lot of it gets changed and morphed by the client. So it's really not our own. So then I started painting again. And I mean, I have a fine arts degree from my undergrad. I started painting again. I started writing again, poetry. I started putting it out there. And then it like raised my happiness level like exponentially. By the way, the one that you just posted, the rabbit. It is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. So beautiful. Thank I was, you. Uh, I couldn't stop looking at it. Well, the rabbits are always uh, me. Yeah. So I paint the rabbit. That actually, probably the one on LinkedIn. Yeah. That's the only rabbit I've ever given away. It was a baby gift. But usually I paint the rabbits. I paint a lot of rabbits. And uh, they're always self-portraits. And the poems that go with them, which that one didn't have a poem because it was a gift. But uh, 
are about me. So Tell me about the rabbits. Um, if you want to. No, no, yeah, I'm happy to. So, when I was a kid... Okay, first of all, it is very hot in Arkansas, for people who don't know. It's very, very <laughs> hot. Like, you know, in Fahrenheit, 110 degrees in the summer, and humid, like you stuck your head in the oven. Oh, my God. So, as a kid, in order to escape... We didn't have air conditioning. I lived in a farmhouse. In order to escape the heat, there was one spot, which was uh, beside a water well that we had, and it was in the shade, because it was in the shade of a barn, and that's where a patch of violets grew, wild violets, which are my favorite flower. And so as a kid, I would go and I would like lay down in that violet patch. And my imagination, that was my play place. So I invented rabbits and elves that lived in this violet patch. So that's where the rabbits come from. And then since then, I've sort of had a, I had pet rabbits when I was a kid and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I love them. I think they're sort of just really beautiful, innocent creatures mm-hmm. and fierce too. I mean, rabbits can be quite fierce. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, so yes, I'm always the rabbit in my paintings, but, um, and their self portraits. Their self portraits. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, the poems that usually go with them are about what's going on in my life that, during that day, which is part of the expression of happiness or of emotion or whatever that we don't get to express as adults. Because then, if we went around expressing our emotions constantly, people would think, well, you're not a good business person. Or, you <laughs> yes. can't handle this. Or, That's right. You know, it's the same thing, yes. right? We kind of hide that. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons I started posting stuff on LinkedIn that was personal, because I didn't for the longest time, when in our career, you look younger than me, but in our career, um, and mostly, and maybe this applies to women more so than men, you're told keep all your private life and your personal life yes. behind, yes, right, behind the scenes. And I remember I used to, people would say, don't take this personally or whatever I'm like, but we're people. We yes. take everything personally. Yeah. And that, this idea always bothered me. That you're one person at work and you're a different person at home. Yes. So when the pandemic started and those two lives mixed, I said, you know what? I'm tired of being one person at work and one person. I'm just going to be me. So I'm going to post what I want to post on LinkedIn. I mean, I I could post a painting every day. I save those for Instagram. But occasionally I, I do post these things. And I posted a story about my mother the other day because this is who I am. And this is all these experiences create your expertise, whatever it is. And I think it's important. That's a really beautiful sentiment. You know, I think, I th- and maybe, and maybe, you know, I, I'm trying to find the good things that came out of the pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. And hold on to those things mm-hmm. because we are creatures of habit. And even though we had this two and a half years of disruption, let's put it that way, um, it's going to be hard for us to just jump back in to, to not hold on to a few things. So I'm really trying to hold on to that. And it sounds like you've like gone all in. I'm it. all in. I, you know what? It's such a beautiful the, sentiment. For me, it was the happiest two years of my life. Yeah. Because I wasn't so rushed. Mm-hmm. And as a single mom, I rushed constantly. Oh, I've got to rush here. and got to make sure the kids mm-hmm. are at school. And then I make dinner when I get home. And everything was just rush, 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 rush. And traffic would stress me out and all these things. And then the pandemic, I got a much better pace. I think my yes. quality of work went up. Um, I also prioritize things in my life. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and then of course started painting and writing and I'm like, you know what, this has been good for me. So big lesson learned for me. Let's keep up with the, yeah, the good things. Well, that's why that comes coming back to the work that we do. Um, and certainly, or if potential shared clients think about in an office environment, the fact that there are millions and millions and millions of people who are living these double lives. Yeah. And what the loss of potential is for corporations when you lose that human potential and that the, the remarkable individuality and beauty and inspiration from individuals when we put everyone into the single box and stack it, for lack of a better term. A cubicle. Yeah. <laughs> Vertically and horizontally. Exactly. Right? Or, uh, it's a hundred percent. You know, if, if for, as a visual for this, because this is an audio mm-hmm. yes. uh, podcast, as a visual, it's like we're stacked in containers vertically and yeah. horizontally. And uh, no wonder we have to perform differently in, in those two different places. And I wonder what your take is on what that new office can be. I see a huge potential. I mean, as a designer, you're always thinking of something innovative and new but you are right there with clients trying to figure out 
their be space, trying to figure out what their vision and values are. You've got a discovery process that you go through with them. What can you tell clients who might be lost a little bit, might be confused, might be... Well, you know as well as I know, we've walked through a million office environments in our life, and not one of them I can say, oh my gosh, let's say 99% of them, I would never want to work in. Mm -hmm. Who really wants to work in a box? (laughs) Who? Really? No one. You wouldn't choose it, no. No, you wouldn't choose it, and I mean, that's like, I think the joke behind the Dilbert cartoon that was so, you know, genius, is that why do we... It's efficient for the process and it's efficient for managing space, but is it the best thing for the person? No. So I had this thing I was thinking of, you know, post-pandemic is the office is a club. If your office was a club and it was a blank slate, what would you do? What kind of activities would you have? Right. And this club is to promote innovation at whatever your job is. Yeah. And it's not to shuffle papers across the cubicle to someone else or to put your headphones on and to do all these things. So if you had to just rethink everything, what really would promote innovation and make people happy and engaged? It's not the office environment we see around. Now, very few people are willing to take a risk because it's a change for them. But I'm like, and maybe I should just sketch up what I think my Sam's dream office would be. But in Sam's dream office, I would have a creativity studio Mm -hmm. because people are not creative enough. It's socialized out of people as they grow up. Yes. So we all know creativity leads to innovation and learn things about yourself you never thought you would do and have. So why not have a creativity studio as an activity in your club? Or here in Canada, we need a sunroom where it simulates sunshine <laughs> yes. in the winter. So I'd have a sunroom in my, my club. You know, yep. I would also have a place where I could have a juice bar and healthy mm-hmm. cooking and, you know, fantastic coffee and all the, those kind of normal things. But I would have comfy chairs and I would have, you know, furniture I actually want to sit on and yes. a lounge around. And truthfully, I'd probably wear house shoes and I'd be, make it acceptable. So no more heels, ladies. I'm done with that. I actually have my studio <laughs> shoes that I change into every day when I go to work. They are the studio shoes. Studio slippers. <laughs> I love that. Well, two years of not wearing heels, I can't even walk them anymore. I'm like, oh my God, we're just going to have to have Uggs from now on. So yes, my club, my office club would just have Uggs. <laughs> Check out your pair of Uggs yes. when you come in. But um, but I think it needs a wholesale rethink. And yes, why not? I agree. Why not? Why not? Like what is, what is holding us back from being innovative and just thinking about office spaces? And what? And again, I go back to the the lost potential of people being innovative and creative, not just for themselves, but what that brings to innovation in an organization. Well, and and also, your work environment has to be better than the kitchen table you've been working at for two years. Hundred percent to get people to come back. Yes, and we all agree <laughs> coming back has a lot of value, face to face interaction. But if I dread my commute because I'm going in to sit in my cubicle, well, then I'm going to look for another job. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a good investment to make, to dream up carte blanche what these things could be. Yeah. I'm always disappointed with clients when they say, you know, just add some collaborative furniture over here. I'm yes. like, that's not going to do it. No. Me. <laughs> paint, the, paint this wall a bright color. I'm like, mm, that's not no. going to work. <laughs> it's, it's the Band-Aid on the, yeah. on the, the thing that's going to keep bleeding out on me. Well, and it's so important right now because everybody has choice. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a choice then you're and, and somebody's going to provide you a better environment, more flexibility and all those things and a shorter commute, well, then go to that. So I think that, you know, it's especially important to, if you want to keep your best people, it's more than just your, your space has to be an extension of your salary. So what are you really offering people? Mm-hmm. And that's the way CEOs, CFO, COO should think about it. What are you really offering people in that environment? Yeah. God forbid it's another beige sea of beige boxes. Yeah. So what is what do you think is the 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 first obstacle for those CFOs, CEOs, COOs, CEOs that they bump up on? What's their resistance? What's the first thing they, they need to let go? Preconceived ideas. Because everybody has preconceived ideas of what they think an office should be. Right. It's Especially people my age or older, you know, you see that, well, this is the way I, you know, grew yes. up in the, yeah. in, in the career, and so this is what it should be. Well, should equals what? Who made that rule, right? right? Just because we've done it that way doesn't mean yeah. we always have to do it. And we do have stats that show a lot of people's productivity did go up during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe engagement and, 
and cultural learning and this and that went down because you're not with your colleagues, but productivity went up. Why? Because people were happier. So I think that that's, I mean, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from sociologists and psychologists and HR folks, et cetera, about engagement. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, the buzzword is experience. Yes, we have to make the experience better, but the experience is not just popping a Perrier into a fridge. And that experience starts before you even set foot in the office. So there's a, there's, you know, maybe there's new job roles. Maybe it's the uh, culture officer Mm -hmm. who says, okay, well, here's how you establish culture across a distributed organization digitally and physically, Mm -hmm. or as I call it, the digital. Digital, (laughs) digital, physical and digital. The digital. Digital. So I like it. You've, you know, and it's just as important that you have things that you're doing for your people at home. Yes. As on site so that everybody feels welcome Mm -hmm. and included and I think, you know, the next few years are going to be chaos while people figure it out. Yeah. And I think the companies that just revert back to, let's go back to normal, they'll lose out. Well, I think the chaos is, is a gift in a way, right? Because the chaos is an indicator that what the market is telling you is time to rethink. But if you butt up against the chaos, then you're not going to find synergy in the new, the new way. Yes. And you continue, you'll continue to feel chaos and feel the results of living in something that's not aligning with where we're going because we're going somewhere different every it's, single moment <laughs> we're going somewhere different we're on the train we're on the train <laughs> right? we're on the train and there is no destination FYI, right and, so. we, and we have to be innovative and creative and nimble and figure it out and, and one of the things I as a as a as an architect and designer You know, we have clients coming to us and say, here's our floor plan and here are the numbers that we want to put into into the space. But operational changes or operational opportunities are not even investigated. So it's just a like a domino shuffling exercise as opposed to, well, how's this organization changing operationally? You mentioned or culturally or culturally. Uh, you know, and and that's where I think we we found alignment in this sort of workplace strategy discovery phase, where that is so important to the end product, and probably even more so than just putting a bunch of desks in yeah. with a number on it, mm-hmm. and like you say, a little collaborative seating in the corner, <laughs> yeah. and you're done, right? <laughs> yeah. And some Perry in the fridge, and we're <laughs> we're off to the races yeah. Yeah, for us. Well, and I think, so as a profession, we have learned a lot in the last 30 years since I've been doing this. And understanding the organizational culture and figuring out how to make that invisible visible Mm -hmm. is our job. Right. And that's what people didn't see before. Like you said, it's just, you know, let's do you fit? Do you not fit? Let's add this, whatever. It's not about efficiency anymore. No. So I think, and that's exciting to me. Me too. Yeah. And I get excited, like, working with clients to say, hey, what do you, what do you want your culture to be? Yeah. Like, what is your competitive advantage against, yeah. you know, your, your competitors? But anyway, what's your competitive advantage? But I do think, so we have a joke, which I will reveal, <laughs> which is called, you know, we do vision sessions, right? Yep. We call them lack of vision sessions. Right. Because 99% of the time, nobody has any vision. Right. And you're like, how can this company be this successful? It could be so much more successful if they could see. Yes. And I think that's why in Sam's office, creativity workshops are so important. Mm -hmm. Because it's making the connection between seemingly unconnected things, learning how your idea affects all these other things, and putting the big picture together. That's missing in a lot of companies. Yeah. And I see it every time we work with someone. And it's nice when they do say, you know what, let's, let's think big. Yes. You know, we can always whittle back if we can't afford it or, you know, it's too much change at once or whatever. But at least let's open up the possibility yeah. box rather than here's your spreadsheet. See if you yes. can fit it into a space. Yeah. One of the things we start doing now before we engage with clients and they want to go through our discovery process is we say, send us your vision statement and your mission statement. Mm-hmm. Because... I feel, as a designer, anything I design needs to support that. That's the anchor to a successful business in your organization. And very often you'd be surprised. These very big, successful organizations have no vision statement. Or they've had one that was developed by the original, Mm -hmm. 
you know, operators, owners in the 60s or 70s when the business was first formed. Mm -hmm. And, And to me, that is a really important underpinning because it goes, like, even when you get to the construction stage, Decisions have to be made and compromises have to be made. What are you weighing it against? Mm-hmm. Right? What are? How are you going to shift those priorities? It has to be anchored back to something really meaningful. Mm-hmm. Your vision and your mission. Because mm-hmm. your office is there to support that mission. As a collective group of people, you're, you're, you're on this journey together mm-hmm. to do this thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if that is not concrete and if that's not laid out, you'll lose people. You lose energy. You lose innovation. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I'm seeing. That's what the research is showing. That's what, yeah, a lot of those, um, you know, more scholarly people than I, uh, <laughs> on on organizational culture are mm-hmm. saying. So I, you know, I, I think even in any discovery process, it's not even about where the cafe goes. It's about what's the vision for this place. Mm-hmm. What are we on? What what mission are we on together? Yeah, and and. What do you hope to accomplish, like, with your employees? Mm-hmm. You know, stakeholders in the mission, not merely... Exactly, not merely employees. That's and right. I, I think that's the... I heard a CEO say not too long ago, imagine if all your employees are volunteers. And that really stuck with me because mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? Because of... And as I mentioned, I had two people poached by clients last week. Yes, it takes a lot of caregiving and a lot of management Mm -hmm. to actually make sure those people are engaged and happy, et cetera. And any way you can do that, whether it's the environment or through your programs or digitally, whatever, I think you have to do Mm -hmm. in order to keep them. I also do believe there are a lot of organizations that like, you know, of course, like vision, but also don't understand how to get the best out of people. And I'm not a pro with that. I'm not. I like to think I'm a decent leader. But most people are never coached on that. No. There's no schooling for it. Well, I don't know. Maybe there is nowadays. But anyway, (laughs) you know, how do you maximize someone else's uh, productivity, happiness, engagement level, et cetera? Yeah. So let's go back to happiness. Mm. That is something I, like, I think we agree on. Mm -hmm. This is is a worthwhile pursuit. What does happiness mean in the new workplace? What does that look like? Hmm. I think happiness in the workplace is creating an opportunity, whether it's physical or digital, for people to contribute their best in the way that they see fit that aligns with the company's values and mission, et cetera. So I like the flattened organization, and I do think the pandemic helped that. All of a sudden we went to hire, well, I have to watch what you're doing. All of a sudden too much right. flatter organization. I do think probably that's why a lot of productivity scores went up because I think people perform better when they have some freedom about how they can contribute a hundred percent. So I think we can, we can continue along that line of giving people the opportunity to, you know, step outside of their box Mm -hmm. and get their work done. If they want to do it at 2 AM or 5 AM or, you know, however that is, I think that is, uh, It's a key component of the future. So, I mean, maybe because I work for a real estate brokerage, you know, I'm sort of a naysayer when people say, oh, but things are going to go back to normal. Everybody's going to, no, you don't go backwards in time. Never in history have we ever gone backwards in time. And to be (laughs) fair, the the, the, the quote-unquote modern office has been the way it's been. We haven't really changed it since the 50s. Oh, since the Industrial Revolution. Right? (laughs) Yeah, we might have soft seating in the corner somewhere, but essentially it hasn't changed. Why not grasp that opportunity? All the indicators are telling us that we're ready for it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think that, I think in 10 years it'll look really different. Mm -hmm. I think the next 10 years are going to be full of experiments. Yes. I do think as the baby boomers retire and even, you know, I'm a generation Xer and in 10 years, maybe I'll get to retire. Um, I'm, that's my hope too. I'm an ex as well. <laughs> okay. I think that uh, younger people will shift things yes. because their expectations are so big. Mm-hmm. And that's why I say in, in things like the real estate forum, what, did you hear me, did you heard me speak at, if you want to know the future, look at the teenagers. Yes. It's that was easy. really insightful actually, because it, it kind of is the, is the, is the lens. Like now I look 
yeah. through that lens. And I think, yeah, yeah, they're, they're different. Their expectations yeah. are through yeah. the roof. Yeah. I, now I know I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere and we had two TV channels. We had three until the tornado hit one of the towers. But anyway, so when they were black and white TV channels, we had no expectations. Yes. I've got two sons, 18 and 22. The $200 sneakers. Each of them bought a BMW with their own money. They went and worked for it, you know. Mm -hmm. But the idea of owning a BMW at 17, I would have... And personally, I was like, well, I'm not contributing to that. But if you earn the money, go buy it. Yeah. That's, But it's not unusual in that crowd. Right. They're like, Mom, we've got friends with Lamborghinis and Mercedes and this and that. I'm like... Are these parents right? <laughs> yes, you've got an old BMW. It costs ten grand. You earned a landscaping. Okay, good. But but you see it. They buy like all that expensive stuff, and they have disposable income, and they have access to images from all around the world. Yes, they know what's good. Yeah, we didn't have that. No, no, no. We were just lucky to follow in our parents' footsteps. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know what? You were, happy, better or worse. you were happy to go to Olive Garden or a Boston That's Pizza right. or whatever. My kids would laugh at me if I said, okay, well, we're going to go celebrate your birthday at the Olive Garden. They're like, what about Ruth Chris Steakhouse? Yes. I'm like, and it's not that I, I don't spoil my kids. It's it, That's just the way they all are. Yeah. And um, I, I, I mean, if I could count the number of times, I would shake my head and just utter exasperation at their expectations. But... Because it is that generation, we will see that make its way into the workplace mm -hmm. where they will not want to come in and work at a beige cubicle, no. right? They're going to say, well, this is boring. Yeah. You know, yeah. they've been raised on video games. Yeah. Where's that interact? Where's the high tech this, that, yeah. the smart boards you write on? Those are, that's old school. You that know? is old school. So if we're designing for the future, and I hope we all are, we're looking those 15 years out, 20 years out, 40, 50 for buildings, right? Mm -hmm. How are we going to incorporate all these things and what are they going to be? Yeah. That's what excites me. I mean, I don't really get to do design anymore. I wish I did sometimes, but um, yeah, I can only imagine what it what it could be in the future. I think the the part that is that we should really hold on to is the potential and the creativity, as opposed to going back into yeah status quo, mm -hmm. because it's really easy to slip back into that. And there's so much potential in just throwing not the baby with the bathwater, but Breaking the box down a little bit and asking what if. Well, and yeah. I think if there's, you know, one big thing the pandemic showed us is that life can change on a dime. Yes. The, the speed at which that virus swept through the world and killed millions of people happened so fast. Yeah. That can happen again. Yeah. People are like, oh, now that the pandemic's over, I'm like, well, you know, there could be another one next year. Or something else. <laughs> or something else, yeah. right? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if a dinosaur came up out of a lake right now and <laughs> stormed <laughs> over. Yeah. There could be something else. Could you could be anything. You can expect the unexpected, <laughs> yes. But it's that, I, you know, that sort of agility that we can't let go of, that yes. idea that you can be agile and, and, and maintain and or grow your business or be faced with chaos and create happiness or be faced with my sister's death and find happiness, mm -hmm. you know, out of buying a dog and figuring out the dog's got the key to happiness, right? Like if you can mm -hmm. look at those challenges and grow from them, whatever the mission is, whatever your mission is in yeah. life, serving coffee, doing architecture, etc., then you will find happiness. Yes. The other world doesn't have enough happiness. I so. agree. And you know, one of the things I always like to think, I always like to hope is that happiness exists already. It's just that we have we we allow ourselves to be blind to it. A hundred percent. And so perhaps it's time for us to open open up a little bit, open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes, and just let it be. Well, look at children. Yes. Naturally happy yeah. people. Yeah. You know, and then they cry and they get over it, and they're yeah. like your best friend again. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, and that gets socialized out of us along with the creativity, and then we turn into miserable adults thinking we have to do something that we have to do in order to get by. Yeah truth is you don't have to do any of it yeah you can stop whatever you're doing right now and go walk out into the lake you know nobody as adults most people will not say no you cannot do that yeah <laughs> you yeah. might lose your job or whatever but there are choices and i think that that's what the pandemic showed us too that yes. people have that people can have that choice and that choice contributes to happiness anyway i like that yes well shall we pause there sure
For more information on this or any other episodes of the Happy Texture Podcast, you can find us at happytexture.com. H-A-P-P-I-T-E-C-T-U-R dot com. Special thanks to our sponsors, Cora Architecture and Interiors, Designing Places for Being. Post-production by Vanessa Hennessy.